So today we are focusing on church membership. We're going to be welcoming in some new members to the family. Amen? Amen. Some of us are happy about that. Amen? And uh, we're just going to, I'm just going to run through, I'm taking some scriptures to give you an overview of the essence of what membership is, church membership. So I'm going to do that and then with much dread and fear and trembling. I'm going to invite the guys who are taking membership to come and stand with me. And if you want to share about why you feel God has called you to ELC, what's special about this place for you, then we'd love you for do, to do that. If you can't bear to do that, Ricky will do it for you. No, uh, if you can't bear to do it, honestly, you haven't got to do it by any means. But uh, we will ask you... We're going to pray over you, encourage you, and it's really wonderful to see the church growing. Amen? So that's an answer to prayer. So let's just pray before we get into the Word of God this morning or this afternoon. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your Word. We thank you. It's the infallible Word of God. It's the canon of Scripture, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that it means to be inspired means to be out of the very breath of God. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you. It's, your word says that you would lead us into all truth, Lord God. So, Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. We pray, Holy Spirit, you will equip us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And it's very important as church. There's lots of different churches out there. There's lots of denominations out there. There's lots of people that represent Jesus in many different ways. But there is only one Jesus. There's only one truth, okay? And there's only one word, which is the canon of Scripture, okay? And sometimes, do you remember, for those of you who aren't too old, remember Eminem, the singer? Remember that? Eminem, the singer, the, the gangster rapper. Okay, well, he, the title of one of his songs was Will the Real Slim Shady Please Stand Up? Please stand up, please stand up. Will the real... No, I'm not going to... But that was, that was the title of one of his songs. Will the Real Slim Shady Please Stand Up? And what's important today is there's so many people of experienced religion, churches, Things like that, but they've never really experienced Jesus, the man. Okay? They've experienced other people's version of Jesus, which can be condemning, unforgiving, uh, punishment, all sorts of stuff. Or total liberality, where you can do whatever you want and it doesn't matter and there's no... We want to represent the real Jesus. We want the real Jesus to stand up, the truth of the gospel, the balance of his love and his grace. Amen? And so that's important for us as a church. So just some thoughts then as we explore membership. Uh, membership to a church is not joining a club. Okay, we're not a club. Okay? We are a family. And we are the family of God. We are, Scripture says, we are adopted into his family. And we become heirs and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. So if I was adopted into a family uh, properly, I would receive an inheritance from that family as well. Okay? I become equal in that family. And that's what God has done with us. He's adopted us into his family. He says, and he, then he said, now you're one of mine. You're one of my own. You belong to me. And we then identify, yes, we have an earthly family, but we also have a spiritual family, which is the global international church of God. But then as that breaks down, you get the expression in different areas. So you get different denominations, different churches, but really we're all the same family. We might express things in slightly different ways, but in essence... To be born again is to be born again into the family of God. Amen? So church membership really is identifying with the local church. For me, church is our ice cream. Fruit, uh, tutti fruity, chocolate chip, raspberry ripple, whatever you like. 
Church is ice cream. Church is ice cream. But there are different flavours. Here, we're probably tutti fruity and a bit loopy. We're probably tutti fruity. But round the corner, there'd be chocolate chip. And that might be more traditional. And then round this way, it could be raspberry ripple. And that might be even more crazy than us. But join an effective life church. You're saying this is the flavour and expression of family that I choose, I want to identify with, I want to be a part of, and I want to grow with these people around me and become a part of that particular expression of the heart of God. And really, that's membership. Okay? Membership's not a load of rules and regulations. But to get the essence of membership from the Word of God, I just want to read a few scriptures this morning. So, Nehemiah, Chapter 1 and verse 2. And it says, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who have survived the exile are back in the province, but are in great trouble and disgrace. For the walls of Jerusalem are broken down, its gates have been burnt with fire. When I heard these things, Nehemiah said, when I heard these things, I sat down, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So you can see Nehemiah's passion for his people, even the ones he hadn't physically met, as soon as he heard what they were going through, it was heartbroken. If it affected them, it affected him. And that's covenant relationship. Amen? That's covenant. If it affected them, it affected him. And so then it goes on to say, Jeremiah 2, chapter 2, the king asked me, why did your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. So Nehemiah was affected by what was going on through or happening to the other Jews. Do you know statistics today what the greatest uh, religion under persecution is? What is the greatest religion under persecution today? Christianity. Christianity is the greatest belief system that is under persecution today. So you see, Nehemiah had such a passion, and Nehemiah then asked for favour, you know the story, he asked for favour to go and rebuild the city, and rebuild the temple. And I just get that sense in his heart, that the love that he had, that when he saw this happening to his people, it so affected him. And that's covenant relationship with one another. David and Jonathan in the Bible had a covenant relationship. They said to each other, no matter what your need is, no matter what the future holds, I'm going to be here for you, even if you're not here for me. That's covenant relationship. You don't get that in the world. You turn your back on me, I'm turning my back on you. But in the kingdom of God, it's, I'm going to be faithful and stand here and be here no matter what. You can come in and out like a revolving door in a hotel, but as for me, I'm going to be faithful, I'm going to be here for you, I'm committed to you, even if you break your commitment to me. That's covenant relationship, and that's what God does for us. How many times have we backslidden and walked away and fouled and sinned and pick ourselves up and repent and only to do the very same thing ten minutes later when you're driving the car in Gravesend? Do you know what I mean? We do and we fall over ourselves and we muck it up time and time again, but yet God remains faithful to us. And a part of our DNA as his children is to be faithful to one another like he is faithful to us. That's a part of the DNA of Christians, of the believer, is being faithful to one another as well. There's purpose in membership. Ephesians 4, verse 11. Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 16 says this. 
So Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure and the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves, blown here and there by every wind and teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people in their uh, deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow and become in every respect a mature body of who him is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body is joined together, held together, every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Now that scripture is a really beautiful image of the body of Christ, holistically. Christ being the head, the responsibility of the leaders and the offices in the church is to what? To equip God's people for works of service. That's the role of the leaders, is to equip the saints for works of service within the body of Christ. Okay? And sometimes we don't like that. We don't want to be equipped for works of service. We want to be equipped for other things. But it says works of service. Then, when we get equipped, it says we will no longer be infants thrown or tossed back and forth by all the wind and and uh, false teaching. And nowadays, if you just go on YouTube or some of these different things, there's so much false teaching about the, the scripture. So much false teaching. And people, you meet them, they get blown around by every wind and doctrine. They've got on the latest fashion of whatever it is, and that's it, the whole church must go this way. What are we doing? Oh, we're doing this, that and the other. Oh, the whole church must go this way. Why? Because this bloke said it and he opened up his cornflakes and that was confirmation, you know? Years ago, a guy told Mara that God had told him that she had to marry him. (laughs) The only reason that didn't happen is because I didn't have enough money to pay him. But, no, no. But this guy said, no, God's told me you've got to marry me, this, that and the other. He took some obscure scripture and he said, I've had confirmation as well. I saw your name in the Sun newspaper. Good job it weren't page three. But I saw your name on the Sun newspaper. And this bloke was completely convinced. And his friends, oh, that's absolutely God then. Oh, that must be God. What a load of old tosh. What utter rubbish. And people get sucked in by wacky, weird, unscriptural, not theologically correct doctrines, and they start believing them and living their lives on them. What was it, 2013, that bloke turned around and said, oh, today, this year is going to be the end, the end of the, end of the world this year, so sell your houses, get rid of all your mortgages, sell everything you have, because uh, midnight, 2014, Jesus is coming back. I mean, these people, they literally did it. They sold their houses, they gave their possessions away. There are lunatics out there that claim to be Christians. And scripture says we we must check things, we must be prepared. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 says, Just as one body, though has many parts, but... All of its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all born by one, or baptised into one spirit, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. Amen? See, when Jesus came, he wiped out the Jewish culture, religion, belief system. He wiped it out. When he came, he did away with the Gentile belief system. He did away with the Greek belief system. He said, there's now one new body, which is my body. You're no longer to identify as Greek or Jew or this or that. You identify in this new man that is Christ Jesus. 
And the whole body, when you carry on, you read that, talks about being joined together so that we fulfill our purpose. And we all have different purposes. And the, the eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And the foot can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Could we all play different parts? Might, might be a big toe. You don't know. I might be an ear, a deaf one. No, I shouldn't be an ear, should I? That's all good. I'll be something else, you know. But we, we all, we're all different parts. And the danger is to say, well, it's not fair. I want to be a nose. I'd rather be a nose than an ear. I'm fed up with all what I have to listen to. And the nose is sitting there saying, you should smell some of the stuff I have to, I have to whiff up, mate. But be content with whatever you are, knowing that your place is important. We all serve different functions, but we have equality and importance and love in the kingdom of God. But we serve different function according to the gifts that God gives. Amen? So there's unity in the body of Christ in value. We all have the same value. Whether you're the latest member of the church or the founding member of the church, we have equality in value. We can be content. Our value is equal. Our roles might be different. It's the same within a marriage. The man and woman, their roles are different within a marriage. But their, their value is identical. Yes. Amen? I know that to be true. I know that to be true because my wife told me. In the church, God has ordained that there, is, there are leaders. Hebrews 13, verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders. Submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who, have, who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, because that will be of no benefit to you. Amen? Now, if you struggle in whatever church you're in to submit to leadership, do you know the easiest answer? Either obey God and submit, or move out of the church. It's that simple. It's literally that simple. I've done it in the past. I've sat under men that I felt were not doctrinally correct. It was affecting my family. And I prayed about it. And it was the right thing for us to move on. And that's what we did. You know? Other times, I've had rebellious streaks in me. And I've had to get my house in order. And I didn't like being told the truth. I didn't like it. The truth isn't comfortable. Jamie Buckingham wrote a book. The truth will set you free. But it will make you miserable first. And it's so true. It is so true. The truth will set you free, but more often than not, the truth that we have to face, especially about ourselves, is not always very nice. You mean I'm not the best thing in the world? And there was me thinking, you know? And sometimes the truth isn't nice about ourselves. But it says, do this so that their work will be a joy and not a burden that would be of no benefit to you. So who gets the benefit? The leader or the person under the leadership? The person under the leadership. They're the ones actually who get the benefit. Uh, I work at Sanctuary as well now, and I say to some of our guys that move into the house, Sanctuary is like supermarket sweep. You can come here and you can get a trolley and you can fill it up. And you can get counselling, you can get drug and alcohol support, you can get your washing done, you've got a roof over your head, we can help you get back to work, we can do all these different things. So by the time you're ready to move on to your own tenancy, your shopping trolley is blimmin' loaded. You are well equipped now for the next season of your life. And that's what sanctuary is like. Or you can come in and grab a shopping basket and you can walk around and whinge and complain that you don't like this and you don't like that. And by the time you're ready to move on, guess what? Your basket's as empty as what it is now, as what it was when you came in. And it's the same in the body of Christ. When you allow yourself to be equipped, when we humble ourselves, when we're willing to learn from one another, man alive, it's like supermarket sweep. You never know what God will do and the doors 
that he can op open ahead of you. In church membership, why do we have church? Church membership is identification. We are identifying with one another that we are a body of people, ELC in our case, and we are working together, we love each other, and we are supporting one another. And it's identification. So those taking membership today are saying, I want to be identified, I'm a part of this. Now scripture says, know those who labour amongst you. That's more than a Sunday morning handshake. To know those who labour amongst you. So we have to be aware. Also, your authority only extends to the level of your commitment. So if you won't, if you, if you won't be committed and take responsibility for something, you can't have authority over it because you're not willing to commit to it. You know. So if I want authority. In my household, I've got to be willing to commit to my wife and my children to stand there and have authority. But if I'm out 24-7 and I don't come home, I'm away for weeks at a time, and I don't care about my family and I, I don't fulfill my role as a husband or father, then what right do I have to exert any authority over my family? Because I'm not taking any responsibility. See, in becoming a part of a family is about responsibility. I'm trying to teach Caleb this at the moment. It's not landing. I'm saying, son, there's other people who live in the house, not just you. And we all have to put stuff. When I was a kid, you had to wash it up. There were eight of us living in our house. My mum, my dad, that took it up to ten. Then a lodger, that was eleven. When you had to do washing up, it was like a prison sentence. You were there forever. All I'm asking is that you get it from the table to the dishwasher. Gazoom! The dishwasher will do the rest for you. You haven't even got to turn it on. It's just not landing. It's it just not got the concept of this thing. So I say, oh, where, where are we having takeaway? Oh, have we got you takeaway? No, son, we haven't got you takeaway. See, we cleaned up all our mess and we put it in the dishwasher and then we said, oh, we'll have takeaway. But of course, you went to your room and you couldn't be bothered to clean your mess and you didn't want to participate and you took no responsibility. So guess what? You have no authority to phone Mr. Gandhi and order a nice takeaway. Next! Amen? It's tight, but it's right. It's a bit tough sometimes, but... And it's the same in the body of Christ. We all play different roles and have different functions of responsibility. You come in and you have the pleasure of walking up the runway of this beautiful blue carpet. But you don't clean it, do you? Do you come and clean the carpet? No, you don't. Do you hoover? No, you don't. Do you dust? No, you don't. Well, yes, I know you are. Not. <laughs> Two nodding, they're like the Churchill dogs. <laughs> but you don't do that. Somebody else does it and you get the benefit. But, but... Do you pay the bills? Do you do the administration? Do you prepare the sermon? Do you do... No, you don't. Why? Because somebody else does that. See, we all have different parts that make up the body of Christ and they're all just as important as each other. Amen? Church membership is not about making some promise. A promise to always... That's not church membership. Scripture says, let your yes be your yes and your no be your no. You're not taking some sort of supernatural promise. You're just saying, hey guys, I think I fit. I've tried on a few pair of shoes and these, these feel comfortable. This feels comfortable to me. I feel at home. I feel relaxed there. I feel that like I want to play a part on whatever this journey is that we're on. That's membership. Membership holds nobody. Do you know what? Whether people are church members or not, if someone leaves, they leave. Being a member makes no difference. Trust me. Right, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> I see that hand, brother. Uh, church membership is not becoming a clone of the person next to you and having to share every view that they hold. We can walk hand in hand. We don't have to see eye to eye. Even in a marriage, you don't see eye to eye. Otherwise you end up with a black eye. You don't see eye to eye. 
in a marriage, do you? You don't. You have different points of view, different angles, different priorities. So me and my wife, we don't see eye to eye on everything. I've just learned to be obedient. I mean, I've just learned to say, yes, dear. Yes, dear. No. No, dear. I don't know what to do, dear. No. Uh, But it's the same in the body of Christ. Now, the danger comes in when it tampers with doctrine. Canons of scripture, which must be correct. And if somebody's in the body of Christ teaching false canons of scripture, false doctrines, then that has to be corrected. But in general, we don't all see eye to eye. We're not clones. And that's wonderful. You don't want everybody to be the same. Everybody's different. We're all individual in that respect. You know, I often say to Mara, how come we had three children? Three! We fed them the same food. They watched the same programs. We, we did the same thing. How can they be so different? What happened? They've run in the wash or something. Something happened. How can they be so different when you bring all three of them up exactly the same? And yet they can be so different. That's because Scripture says God created them in the secret place of the womb. He knitted them together. Psalm 139. Wonderful. Amen? So we don't, we're not some cult where everyone's got to have the same point of view. But we are a family. We are, as Peter put it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare his praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Notice scripture never talks about individuals when it's applying the family. Can you be, can you not go to church and still go to heaven? Yes, of course you can. You going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's a relationship with Jesus that makes you go, makes you a Christian. But coming to church identifies you in the body of Christ. Coming to church helps you fulfil all the one and others of Scripture. Coming to church is to be a part of a family. Jesus isn't coming back for an individual. He's coming back for his children together, corporately. And you can sit outside of church life and what will happen is you will windle, you will dry out, you will struggle because the body needs the body. If I chop my finger off, will it become any less of a finger if I put it on the shelf? No, it will be a finger. It will remain a finger, but it will be a bony finger. It will have no life in it. It will not be able to function as it's meant to function being on the end of the hand, which now it serves its purpose with the other fingers. But if I chop it off and put it on a shelf, I can stand and say, well, it's a finger, it's got every right to be on the shelf. It has, but it will never achieve what its purpose is. And its purpose is to be with the rest of the fingers on the end of the hand to make a difference, which is handy. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. My friend. I'll be signing autographs at the end. No. Uh, we have diversity in culture but unity in kingdom. We come from different backgrounds and all sorts of cultural diversities and differences and everything else. And you've got to celebrate it, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're green, whether you're pink, whatever you are. If you identify as a lamppost, we found you a doctor, but, you know, whatever you are is fine. But we come together and we identify as one body in the kingdom of God. One new man in Christ Jesus. Amen? John 15 verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than he lay his life down for his friends. Greater love has no one than they lay their life down for his friends. A friend of mine who was a pastor of a church said to me years ago, you know Matthew, once somebody's been a Christian for a year, and they've sat in a church for a year, they should be serving within the church. 
If their mentality is, I don't want to serve because I won't get fed, they really have not understood the gospel at all. And they will stay and get fatter and fatter and fatter. They will have more and more opinions, but they will actually achieve nothing. They'll just be full of opinions and get fatter spiritually, I'm talking about, but not actually achieve anything. Church isn't about what I get out of it. If, if church was about what I get out of it, I would have stopped going to church years ago because there have been many dry seasons that I didn't get anything out of it at all. For me, church is what I put in it. I can remember years ago I was moaning to God and I was having a bit of, we- a bit of a whinge about church leaders and different things. And then over the years I grew and I got involved in church leadership and then networks and different things. And I, I, would, I was getting quite excited about what I was... It was like going up this cup with expectation. I was on the outside and I'm going higher and higher and I'm all excited to look at what's inside the cup in this leadership sphere. And I'm thinking, wow, it's going to be covenant, it's going to be this, it's going to be all these different things. And when I got to the top and I actually looked in, it was empty. And I thought, what a load of old tosh. I was really disappointed. Felt really let down by the church leaders I'd admired from afar. And thought, well, there's no depth. It's just, just Sunday morning talking. Where's the depth of any of this? And I was really disappointed. And I started to moan. And the Lord said to me, shut up. It wasn't my wife. It was the Lord. Shut up. Stop moaning. Stop moaning about what's not in it and be the one who puts something in it. You do something. Stop moaning. Stop criticising. Do something yourself. If they're unloving, be loving. If they're tight-fisted, be generous. Do, the, do what the Word of God says. And do you know what? I did it, and it worked. It amazed me, you know? So, for me, I come to church, firstly, to give my worship to God. I come so I can just stand... I can focus on God and I can give my worship. I come to pray. I come to sit and listen to the word of God because it equips me and it sharpens me. And I come to have fellowship and I come to serve. How can I help? How can I bless? How, what, what can I give and be an encouragement to what God is doing? Amen? See, for those footballers, for football fans, I'm a terrible football fan. I'm awful. I'm so critical. Honestly, Luke, shut up. I'm so, honestly, I'm so quick. I, I swear undying love to my team, or God's team, which is Arsenal. But anyway, I swear undying love. I'll tell you what, if they let one goal in, I'm like, sack the lot of them. Just why do we even bother? Uh, why you put the TV on? The wretched team. They're the thorn, thorn in my side, they are. Then we get a goal. Like, I told you. I knew it. I knew we'd come back. I knew we'd get there. You just got to be patient. It'll work. Then we, we look, another go goes in by the opposite. Useless. Useless. Lot of them. The entire team should be crucified in London publicly. And let's throw things at them as well. And then we equalize at the best in the world. What a fabulous, talented group of men. Give them a pay rise. Honestly, I'm useless. But see, lots of people like to stand on the sidelines and be and critique. But they're not willing to go to practice and actually practice and actually get on the pitch and be a part of the team. And there's a huge difference. But membership is saying, I want to be a part of this team. I want to support it. Financially, Malachi 3, verse 8 to 11, we, we know the scripture. It says, will a man rob God, yet you've robbed me in the tithes and offerings. Now, what God was actually, the point he was making was that the Israeli nation were not giving financially. They were not looking after the widows and the orphans within the nation of Israel. And other nations began to notice and point it out at how impoverished they were and the problems they had. So that reflected bad on God. God looked bad. It made it look like God didn't care. So God rebuked the Jewish people for it. He said, look, what are you doing? Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. And it's because they were not 
fulfilling their responsibility. Now, as the church, we don't live under the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. He met the criteria of the law. We live under grace. But there's still an expectation that we will support financially. Okay? But we don't give. I don't give under the law, under the Malachi law. I've been set free from the Malachi law. I don't give under that law. I give because I choose to give. I want to give. And the New Testament says that makes me an extravagant giver. Amen? Now, some people like to put a proportion of their income aside to give because it's a good discipline for them. Other people do it differently. But whatever you do, Scripture says, do with a joyful heart, with all your heart, and take responsibility for the family. Amen? And that's a part of membership, taking responsibility for our family. I've touched on this already, but it said, watch out for false prophets. They come into you as sheep, in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Be careful. Second Timothy 3, 5 says, How they have a form of godliness, but deny its power. Have nothing to do with such people. And that scripture, that second one, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. That is such a powerful scripture because it's saying, look, there's people out there, they have a form of godliness. They, they sound like sheep. <laughs> That's what they sound like. So when you talk to them, they can talk the talk. So you can talk sheep together. <laughs> and you can do it. Because they're sheep. It says that they have a form of godliness. So they sound like sheep. They know the word of God. Don't forget, when Satan tried to tempt Jesus, what did he use? Scripture. He used the word of God. That's what Satan did. Doesn't it not say you can turn this bread uh, these stones into meat, doesn't it not say, throw yourself off this pinnacle and you'll be saved, doesn't it not say? So they can talk the talk, they can have knowledge of scripture, they can attend church services, but when push comes to shove, the thing they deny is love. Not talking love, but genuine love. The genuine love of God. That bit they deny. It says, had nothing to do. So they deny, what is the power of God ultimately? Love. Love. God is love and love is God. It comes from the same essence. So the power of God is not the miracles to create this and the miracles to create the universe and the miracles to set this in place and that in place. In actual fact, the power of God is love. And you can meet people who have lots of theology and lots of experience but what's the genuine love? Is there genuine love? What comes out of their mouth? Is this love motivation? Is this coming from a place of love? And that is how we're called to identify those who are not true. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So being a part of... Church life is protection for one another. You can weigh things up. You can say, well, what do you think about this? I heard this, I saw this, what do you... And, and there's a, a sense of protection because that's the body of Christ. And the last scripture, Matthew 22, verse 36. The religious leaders, when Jesus walked the earth, the religious leaders were continually following Jesus. Not supporting him, but following him. And they were looking constantly for different ways to trip him up. So no matter what, he, he couldn't put a step right for getting it wrong in the religious eyes. And they were constantly looking to trap him and confuse him and pull him down and prove that he was false. So this scripture says, teacher, their religious leaders are, 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 are beckoning, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, they were talking about the Torah. 
and they would all be well equipped and well versed in the Torah. So what's the most important commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself, for all the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Now what I love with Jesus, they ask one question, what is the greatest commandment? One question, expecting one answer. Jesus comes back with two answers. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind and all your soul, and love your neighbour as yourself or your brother. And he brought equality with loving God and equality with loving one another on the same level. See, the cross is like that. From, from God to man and then sidewards from man to man. And if it's just like that, it's not complete. Or if it's just like that, it's not complete. The cross complete is our love for God causes a chain reaction in the heart that causes you to love other people. And I've met some Christians, they say, yeah, me and God, fine. These people can't stand them. Got no time. Or you meet other Christians, they say, well, it's just me and God, I don't need any other Christians in my life. And I think, man alive, seriously, are you saved? You might think you're saved, but are you saved if that's your mentality? Because the result of being born again, inside you there's a birthing of love for one another. There's some people you think, I don't even like Mike, but I just can't help but love him. That's not a confession. That's not a confession, Mike. Oh, it's an example. Sure, uh, put the pen down. No. Put the pen down. No. Do you know what I mean? There are some people, maybe in the natural realm, you wouldn't choose or associate with. You just wouldn't make that connection. But in the kingdom, because you love God, you go, oh, gooey. You know, oh, aren't they lovely? Well, look at Rita. Lovely Rita meter maid. She's great. Oh, she's got, she got, she's been upgraded. She's got a plumber. Yeah, yeah, you know what Rita's like with her DIY men? She's been up, updated to a plumber who gives her the card. You can, you can call on me 24 hours a day. Yeah. To service her plumbing. Yeah, she's so excited. Look at her. But the body of Christ, do you know there's one thing as a parent that all of us must love? is when your kids are getting on well and you sit back and say, do you know what, they're brats, but I love them. And they love each other. And that's a wonderful expression. It's a wonderful joy. And I'm sure it's exactly the same with God, that he must look down. That's why scripture emphasises unity, unity, unity in the body, unity in the family. I would rather lose the argument than lose the relationship with somebody. I would rather let them think I'm wrong. I don't care. I don't mind. I'd rather lose the argument than lose the relationship because the relationship's more important than the argument. Amen? So there's some thoughts on membership. The last scripture is this one. It's when Saul was uh, on the road to Damascus. Saul had been killing Christians left, right and centre, been killing them, and on the road to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus. Suddenly there's a bright light around him, and the voice of the Lord Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul never persecuted Jesus directly, ever. But yet, on the road to Damascus, Jesus appears to him and says, why do you persecute me? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Why? Because Saul was persecuting all the Christians, the early church, and he was killing them. And it was so personal. We have to be careful not to pull each other down, but rather to build each other up. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And you might think, well, you know, it doesn't matter, I'm only saying this, that and the other about Woz. Be careful, because Woz belongs to the Lord. Be careful. Be careful what you say about each other, because we all belong to God. 
Amen? And that's the wonderful joy. So I hope that enlightens you a little bit on membership or the heart of what membership is about.